I'm not talking sort of hard questions. These are some of the hardest questions you will ever see on the SAT. And if you're going for a high juicy score, you're not going to get there unless you know how to take down these three questions. All right, guys, so here's the first question. We're going to go over the concepts and the key shortcuts you need to have for these three questions. And these questions are from official SAT practices. So I highly recommend you print them out and try it with me. So let's get started with the first question. The question says, in the XY plane, a parabola has a vertex at this location and intersects at X axis at two points. If the equation of the parabola is written in the form of that and ABC are constants, which of the following could be the value of A plus B plus C? So a couple of important details over here. So our vertex is located right there. So it's going to be like nine and 14. So it's going to be about there. And because our X axis intersects at two points, which means our parabola is going to open upwards, which means our A value is going to be positive. And because the question gives us the location of the vertex, we're going to go straight into the vertex form, which is a question pattern for the SAT. Vertex form looks something like Y is equal to A parentheses X minus H, which is going to be nine squared plus K, which is going to be minus 14 in this question. And from here, there's not much we can do here. So we're just going to expand out the vertex form, which it looks something like a x minus 18 x plus 81 minus 14, like so expand it out a x squared minus 18 a x plus 81 a minus 14. And that is the equation of the parabola, which can also be rewritten in this form right here ax squared plus bx plus c. And because the question is asking us to find out a plus b plus c, let's find out what a plus b plus c would be. And because the question is asking for a plus b plus c, our a value is coefficient of x squared. So it's just going to be this a right here, which is going to be just a plus b is going to be coefficient of x, which is minus 18a. So we're going to do negative 18a plus c value is going to be the constants. 81a minus 14. If we combine the like terms, we're going to get 64a minus 14. And that is what your a plus b plus c is going to be. And based on that, how are we supposed to find out which one the correct answer is? Well, it can't be a, b or c. It can only be d. And here's why. We know that our a plus b plus c is equal to this over here. And we know that our a value has to be what? Our a value has to be positive. And even if our a starts at zero and go up to zero, one and two, our overall result as a whole, a plus b plus c is only going to go up as the number gets bigger. And if that's a little confusing, if you think about it in terms of a number line, let's say this is positive and minus here, when a is equal to zero, our a plus b plus c is going to be just minus 14. And as our A value gets bigger, what's going to happen is that we're going to add 64 every single time, which means our overall result is also going to get bigger and go in that direction. That's why any number smaller than minus 14, like minus 23, minus 19, is not going to work. And why can't it be negative 14? Because you would need A to be zero in order for C to be the answer. But we know that our A value has to be what? It has to be positive and zero is neither positive nor negative. So A cannot be zero, which means our answer is going to be choice D. Does that make sense? So the main takeaway from this question is one, recognizing the pattern of whenever you're given a parabola and you're given a vertex, go straight into the vertex form. And two, when it comes to level five questions on the SAT, it's not about identifying the exact value. Sometimes you have to infer what the answer would be based on the clues you have find, like we did in this question. Does that make sense? Cool. If you have any questions, leave in the comment section down below. Let's go to the next question. The next one looks something like this. The question tells us in the expression right over here, B is going to be a constant and it can be written in the form of that right there, where H, K, and J are going to be integer constants. So they're going to be whole numbers non-decimal numbers, which of the following must be an integer. So this question is one of those must be true questions. And the key here is for you to knock out as many answer choices as possible by looking for an exception, because if there is an exception to the rule, then it's not going to be must be true. So let's tackle this question. So the first thing we're going to do is try to get as much information about H, K, and J and the unknown variables. So where can we do that? Well, we know that this is the same thing as this over here. And we know that if we expand out this two factors right here. We know that we're going to get something like H X squared plus some kind of middle term plus K J. And when you compare this to the original equation, we're going to get four X squared plus B X minus 45. And matching up the coefficients, we know that our H value is going to be four. And then our K times J K times J is equal to minus 45. And because 
k and j have to be integers, we know that k and j are going to be whole number factors like 9 times 5 or 15 times 3, 45 times 1, whatever. So now that we have some information, let's find out which one cannot be the answer. So if you look at choice A, we have B over H, and we know that H is going to be 4. So as long as B is a multiple of 4, like 4, 8, 12, 16, then we know that this is going to give us a whole number, which gives us a integer. But the problem is that we don't really know exactly what B is going to be. Unlike H, we know it exactly is 4, B can be anything. And you could try to expand out the middle term, but it's going to get really messy and you're not going to be able to find out exactly what B is. And because we don't know exactly what B is, there's so much uncertainty and risk, so we are not going to pick choice A. And then we're also going to do the same thing with choice B as well. And what about choice C? 45 over H or 45 over 4? 45 is not a multiple of 4, so we know it's not going to be an integer, so C is out. And what about choice D? 45 over K? Well, we know that K is going to be what? K K is going to be a factor of minus 45. So whatever K is, whether it be 9, 5, 15, 3, 45, 1, whatever it is, if it goes in there and 45 is divided by it, we know that we're always going to end up with a whole number. And because we're always dividing by a factor of 45, we know that the result is always must be integer. So our answer is going to be choice D. And if that explanation is kind of confusing, here's another angle to look at it from. We know that kj is equal to minus 45 over here. So if we move k to the other side, we get j is equal to minus 45 over k. And minus sign really doesn't affect whether it's an integer or not, so we can just ignore it. And from there, we get 45 over k. 45 over k is going to be equal to j. And what do we know about j? j is going to be a integer, which means it's always going to be a whole number. So it satisfies this condition as well. So the main takeaway from this question was making the connection between this structure and that structure right here and realizing that, oh, H is going to be that and KJ is going to be that. And then you have to draw conclusions based on the clues you have and look for an exception because when it comes to must be true questions, your goal is to come up with exceptions as to why each of these choices cannot be must be true. This one wasn't too bad, but let's go to the third question, and it's gonna look something like this. The question says, for each real number r, which the following point lies on the graph of each equation on the xy plane in the given system. So it's relatively a simple, straightforward question where you have to just plug in the data points, but the key here is that it's gonna take forever if you plug in all of these data points. There are many ways in which SAT makes the questions hard, and one way to do so is by making a question very lengthy and have a lot of busy work in there so that you spend way too much time on this question and miss out on the other questions. So here's how you tackle these questions. So first, you really want to read the question carefully because there's a lot of gold in here. The question says it lies on graph of each equation, right? And if we look at these two questions carefully, we see that, wait, that's times five, that's times five, that's times five. These two equations are essentially the same identical equation. You can literally divide this equation by five and you're going to end up with this. And graphically, they are going to be like literally two lines on top of each other. They're going to be identical. And what that means is as long as the point sits on one graph, that means it's also going to sit on the other graph because literally, literally the same graphs. So that technically chops down the workload into half. So let's find out what to do next. And we're going to go to the answer choices. So again, the top priority here is to save as much time as possible. So instead of starting with these two choices because they look kind of complicated. I'm going to start with choice C and D and hopefully our answer is in there somewhere. So if we plug in our R value, let's say we plug into the top one because it looks simpler. We get 2R plus 3Y is equal to 7. 3Y is equal to 7 minus 2R divided by 3, divided by 3, goes away. When our X is equal to R, our Y value is supposed to be this over here. Choice C doesn't look like it. Choice D doesn't look like it. So that's going to be out. Let's look at choice A and B. I'm going to try choice B first because A looks really complicated. I, I don't want to do that unless I really have to. And for choice B, I'm going to plug in the Y value because I don't want to plug all that into the equation. So we are going to get 2X plus 3R is equal to 7. 2X is equal to 7 minus 3R. We have divided by 2, divided by 2. Our X is supposed to be this right here and we get minus 3r over 2 3 over 2 plus 7 over 2 so we know that our choice b is going to be the answer does that make sense and again when it comes to these busy work questions it's all about saving time and if i had to plug in choice a to get the answer and when i plug it in for x or y i know that 5 is going to cancel out with 10 or 15. your goal is to keep your work simple and straightforward as possible and save as much time as possible and if you're wondering john what if the numbers don't work out pretty like that so if your numbers are getting big or complicated that means you're not using the the right shortcuts that SAT had put in for you. And the last takeaway from all these questions is that there is always going to be a fast and easy and quick way of solving these questions. The hard part is figuring out what they are. And to get faster at identifying what they are, you just have to drill down on a lot of these hard questions.